So Christians have uh, a responsibility to the government. Uh, I've been doing a lot of thinking about this lately, especially in the wake of our kind of current cultural situation that we find ourselves in. Everything seems to be more heated, uh, more controversial reading the headlines in preparation for uh, for this, um, for this uh, video, I'm always trying to gauge what's kind of coming down the cultural pipeline. And there's something that, while at first may not seem like it has to do with a current cultural event, I think it has to do with all the current cultural events. Um, and that's our responsibility as Christians to the government. And uh, mainly we we get this in Romans 13. Now it's, uh, I think Leon Morris or John Stott or somebody said about these verses uh, <laughs> that no other set of verses have caused the Christian more anguish, something like that. I'm paraphrasing um, because Romans 13 says that, that every person, and I quote Romans 13, one says, every person is to be subject to the governing authorities. Paul doesn't really mince words here. He doesn't <laughs> use ambiguities. Um, there's no tricks of interpretation, as far as I can tell in the study I've done on this uh, passage in the past. You know, Paul says that the, the Christian submits because the authorities have been established by God to do God's work, mainly to uh, reward good and, and punish evil. So what's it look like, uh, given the political climate that we find in find right now, ourselves in right now today, to submit to the government. We have the leaders of our country advocating for things like gender realignment, surgery, and, and abortion. That's the biggest probably issue right now. Uh, all the stuff I, I saw Elizabeth Warren, she was talking about, you know, trying to close the doors of pregnancy, uh, crisis pregnancy centers, because they're a, they're a threat to the health of women. Um Although oftentimes these things like abortion and these gender realignment surgeries, they're paid by taxpayer money, uh, yours and mine. <laughs> uh, in, in, in the wake of uh, overturning of, of Roe v. Wade, things are getting more and more contentious, it seems like. Today, we're, uh, we're, it seems like arguing is everywhere. And uh, as the government continues to pursue some of these things in which we're diametrically opposed to, for, as a Christian, from the Christian worldview, What's it look like to uh, submit to that government? And today we're going to talk about what it looks like for the Christian to submit, even as our government becomes more opposed to the Christian worldview. At the end of the 15 minutes that we have together, we'll have, a, I'm hoping, a better understanding of what it means to submit to the government, even when we disagree with that government. Um, so this is to the point. Uh, I'm John Noyes. It's my bi-weekly uh, video series where I seek to address and dissect a culturally relevant issue from a distinctly Christian world view. So the real question for us uh, is, what does it mean to submit? Uh, the answer to this question, I think, finds its beginning in a distinction uh, between a submission and obedience. I'm going to argue just briefly that they aren't the same thing, and I think that this is actually a common uh, argument. Many of you uh, who have processed what Romans 13 is saying in the context of our current culture and what we're talking about today, you've probably come up with this distinction. It's a popular distinction between submission and, and obedience. E even acts of uh, disobedience, though, can be done while in submission. And I'm just going to show this by way of example, right? So Luke uh, gives us a clear example of this in Acts 4 when when uh, Peter and John, uh, they're preaching Jesus out in the public, right? Um, and and then they're preaching the resurrection and the governing authorities said that, well, the scriptures say that they laid hands on them and put them in jail. And Peter and John, they didn't resist the arrest, but they submitted to the authorities. And, and notice in the, in the story, it wasn't until they were told not to preach the gospel when they became disobedient. I um, mean, even then they did so while also continuing to submit uh, to the authority of um of the day by by suffering the consequences of their disobedience, ultimately giving them uh, permission in, in one sense to, to jail them. Ultimately, they gave their lives uh, in pursuit of submission, um, but not always obeying. And I think that's important, an important distinction, a true distinction. You can be in disobedience while also obeying, meaning you, you disobey the order given, but then the submission comes when you are uh, subjecting yourself to the authority of the government that was placed over you and then the consequences that come with that. Um, 
you know, so so our real concern really has to do with authority and, and the duty of a Christian citizen under that authority. Yeah, guys, rulers abuse the power of the state, but that doesn't alter or change the Christian uh, responsibility to fall under that authority. And this is really difficult and brings us actually um, to something I think is really, really important. Uh, the Christian doesn't submit for submission's sake. Uh, we have purpose in that, right? We we submit to either support or we submit to subvert. First, submit to support. Uh, this is actually the easy one, right? When, when uh, the government is doing its job, mainly when the government is rewarding good and punishing evil according to God's standard of good and evil, we come alongside that government and submit to its rules, laws, and principles so long as they align with God's rules, laws, and principles. Um, the truth of the matter, if we survey the world and world history, uh, this is actually really rare, right? Government systems, um, while they might start, like the United States is a great example, we have laws on the books and um, uh, murder, right? We, you can't go around murdering people. We have laws in the books that are based on God's law, which is really great. Um, but governments rarely align themselves with God's commands and, and stay to it for very long. And that's why Paul actually wrote Romans 13. If you think about it, there'd be no need to... Um, to clarify this issue, to add this, and notice, like, we're going to talk about a little bit about this, but where Paul places this, uh, he, he's talking about relationships in Roman, the end of Romans 12, and then he carries on with relationships after this. So this is just one segment, like, what's the Christian relationship to government? He wouldn't have written it if it wasn't a problem or an issue that they were trying to add clarity to. Um, so that's why it's here. You know, if there wasn't a problem, there'd be no need to clarify this issue if the relationship between the Christian and the government was was in perfect order. Um, but Paul puts it in for a reason, you know. So, and before we uh, move on, I think it's important to understand something here. There's only one ultimate uh, legitimate government, and that's the kingdom of God. Jesus is Lord. God is king. Every other uh, system of earthly rulership uh, falls far short of that. It may be a shadowy representation of, of God's ruling and the kingdom that God would have, but we are citizens of, king, of, of, of the kingdom of God. And, um, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean we don't have responsibility ultimately to submit and fall into the rulership of the earth, earthly systems that God has placed. And that's what Romans 18 gets to. And this is nothing new. This, this like started way back. We, we read it in first Samuel eight, when, when the aging prophets own children became corrupt judges, uh, they were, they were horrible children. They were horrible judges. So the Israelites cried out for a King. They came to Samuel and they, they said, we want to be like the world around us. We want to have the, an earthly kingdom. We want to have these other judges, these kings to judge us, you know, and then and in effect, they became or had the desire and ultimately became synchronistic with the culture around them. Um, the the idea didn't sit well, if we remember, <laughs> it didn't sit well with Samuel and Samuel's like, uh, it, it, it's um, the scripture actually says it was displeasing in the sight of Samuel. And, and when they said, give us a king, so what do you do? Uh, well, he went to God with it and he said, God, check out what they're doing. And God said to give them what they want. He said, don't worry, they're not just rejecting you. They're rejecting me too. And then he offered like a huge warning of what's going to happen, but you can have what you want. Um, and then this is a principle that's carried on throughout the scriptures, right? I, um, Romans 1 reiterates this too, where, you know, God gives them over to their fleshly desires. God gives us over to the things that we want. So we stand in judgment already, which is another reason for governments, but we're going to get, we're not going to get into that today. Um, <clears throat> so, so in, in, in hindsight, not much has changed from the time of Samuel. We too have um, become synchronistic with the culture and, and bought into the lie that neutrality exists uh, with man and with, with man and government, right. Or, or the government is neutral. And uh, this is why I think one of the reasons why we're in the mess we're in today uh, there, there's no neutral government. Uh, the, the government is either for God or against him. And, and currently, I think we're sold out uh, to a secular government in pursuit of the lie of neutrality. And, and I have a couple examples uh, just to bring up briefly about this, you know, um, and it starts with oftentimes a school. Right in school, there no no prayer in school. We don't want to have you pray. Uh, we just want to no, so you can't offer prayers before school hand, um, before school starts. We we just want to be fair to everyone. That's the justification for it. It's a neutral position. No prayer is neutral. And the same thing for um, for example, um, teaching on God's commands. Right, we're not going to teach on the Ten Commandments. We're not even going to allow the Ten Commandments on the front of a building because. We want to appeal to everybody. Therefore, if we move, if we strip the Ten Commandments from curriculum and buildings, 
then we're neutral to everybody who walks by, you know, not, not everyone believes in the same God. So, so we're just going to take a, a neutral position and, and not teach anything except notice uh, they are teaching something <laughs> and these actions do uh, project something, mainly relativism and religious pluralism. Nature abhors a vacuum, friends. You remove one worldview from any system and another one will creep in. And more often than not in the West, it's secular naturalism. And, and this is actually, the, in my opinion, where we're at today and, and why we feel this great tension we feel. Uh, we're in the desert. We're, we're wandering. I, I, I firmly believe that. We are wandering and we're in the desert, but history is moving forward by the Spirit of God. And, and we can be confident uh, in our wandering because Jesus is already victorious. God's already um, won the battle, right? He's, he's, he stands in victory already. But that doesn't mean submitting is easy. I don't know about you, but submitting is is like it's all but a four-letter word. Uh, in my house, it's a hard thing to do, which brings us to the second way we submit. So that we we first we submit to support. If the government is doing what it ought to do, we can support that. And this can be a combination of, th of things too, right? It's not in certain things it's doing great. In other in other ways, it's not doing all that well. But the second way we submit is we submit to subvert. And uh, when when the government's uh, failing to uphold righteousness uh, and rewarding good and punishing evil, the Christian still submits, but with the intention of subverting or ultimately replacing that government. And now, hear me, because this is really important. I am not saying that we riot and that we flip cars over and we light them on fire and, and, and all of this stuff. No, the, the means by which we do this is difficult. It's not through uprising. It's not through war, riots, and, and other or any use of force. Um, or not even necessarily voting. The, the, those are the tactics of the world. We subvert through radical love. Uh, notice Roman, Romans 13, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Romans 13 is preceded by, by these words. It, and I quote from, from Romans 12, If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I'll repay, says the Lord. Paul goes on, if, if, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. That's what I mean by subvert, like by, by radically loving people who we disagree with, by radically loving, um, we actually <laughs> uh, convict those souls. Those souls are convicted through the spirit of God when we love. Uh, and Paul says, uh, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with Good. Now that's that's Romans 12, 17 through 21. I mean, that's right before our verses submit to the government. Do you think it's intentional that Paul did this, said this? I do. You know, it, it's because it's only after this in Romans that, that Romans 13 comes and submitting to the government starts. Um, so why do we why do we submit to uh, broken and often corrupt governments? Well, we submit to smash them with love in the in the hopes of of them coming to Christ, and and it it, it works if we follow God's principles. You know, uh, we use the the oppression as opportunity to help our oppressors see Christ, not rebel and riot. That's what the culture of confusion does. You know, Jesus modeled this, and I love. I mean, this is the, you know WWJD, right? Jesus modeled this when he when he looked. He's hanging on that tree, and he's looking at, at the at the at the very people who put him up there. And what did he do? He pleaded with the father for their forgiveness. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And in Matthew's account, Matthew says that the centurion and, and those who were, who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, it says when, when they saw the things that were happening, they said, truly, this was the son of God. See, there's, there's a submission to subvert. There's a subversion. They, they see this radical love pouring out from Jesus on the cross and they're converted. You know, Paul says, rejoice in, in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Uh, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. First Peter 2, 21 through 23, for you've been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his own steps who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. You know, not, notice also where, where Paul takes us after Romans 13. 
and then so he has a submit to the government and then he he reiterate, reiterates Jesus's command to love our neighbors <laughs> Uh, the paragraph above submitting to the government is wedged between commands to love your enemy the and and love your neighbor. It's like a love sandwich here, you know, and, and this is not by accident. There's always been this tension between the Christian and his responsibility to the prevailing government. I feel it too, guys. I'm, I'm right there with you. As Christians, we're, we're to be salt and light to a flavorless and dark world. Though Remember, the world is dark. They're dead. The world is dark, and, and they're going to bump into things because they can't see. So, so, so how we react in the, and, and interact with the, the political culture around us, it actually matters. You know, I'd, I'd argue that in modern times, not only have we bought the lie of neutrality, but there's, a, there's been a conflation of evangelicalism with, with political conservatism. And I think that this is done largely in error. And I, I hear me guys, I like, well, I, I think that there's a, there's a lot of overlapping principles here, like, like being pro-life and in favor of traditional marriage and in liberty in general. You know, I, I, but I'd like to be clear that Christ does not align himself with any political system because all of them fall short of, of the only legitimate government, and that's the kingdom of God. And that's the, that's the kingdom of which Christ is king. I mean, he's, kingdom, he's king of it all, but that's because the, the, the kingdom of, of God is, is the here but not yet. It's the one that will be fully consummated and Christ will rule and reign um, uh, with final authority. You know, so, so I'm going to start wrapping up. I'm 16 minutes in. I got another two minutes maybe. Um, there are, there are a few things I just want to be clear about. Uh, there are, there are a few principles that I think that we have to hold firm to as we submit to the governing authorities here too, even as we seek to subvert. And the first is in my mind, the most important, you know, truth is always, always paramount. Uh, we, we stand on truth when we defend the unborn, or we stand on truth when we defend traditional marriage or, or cisgender reality, you know, standing firm with the truth will come at a cost. You know, the day is coming when when we'll have to decide between holding the truth or our own comfort and and even possibly our survival. Many of us, as as, the, as, as things start to shift and change away from a, a Christian worldview uh, out there in the culture and the government, certainly we may lose our jobs and our livelihoods, you know. And, and as we submit uh, to subvert, I want to make it clear that, that we never sacrifice truth. Often truth, guys, is, is the first pillar of society that's pushed against in order for society to crumble. When, when, uh, when governments and people seek to transform society, they, they first try to push at truth. And remember, uh, this is nothing new. Uh, Genesis 3, right? Did God really say is what the serpent said to Eve, right? We, they attack truth. And this is why we can't hang rain, rainbow flags or, or BML signs in our storefront windows and, and live not by lies, which I absolutely love. I'm going to recommend a few resources in, in a minute, but live not by lies by Dreyer. Uh, he points out that that sacrificing truth in pursuit of comfort is, is actually going to lead to the demoralizing of, of our world, demoralizing of our culture. Uh, the second thing to remember, I think, is that, that families are so very, very important. As we seek to submit, to subvert, a lot of that's going to come from the family. And we have to continue to protect and nurture traditional family units. Uh, when the family suffers, uh, so does the culture. And when we've seen that in a very real way. And it's also in the, in the context of the family. This is where we first learn to love, uh, radically love. Um, and that's where our sub you know, when we submit to subvert, that's where this all comes from is the love. And we're going to learn how to love in the context of the family, but not just the family, also the church. Uh, the, the church is, is, uh, is the foundation of the resistance that we're talking about. The church is where the, um, the alternative worldview uh, comes from, where we offer the world something better, right? I like to say it like this, that the church is actually should be, or it ought, ought to be, the church ought to be a theater of the future, right? So, so when an, on, an outwardly faced world, they turn their gaze into the church of Jesus Christ, they should see uh, a preview, a, 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 a foggy, a, a, a dimly lit preview of the kingdom that's coming, right? The heavenly kingdom. Um, Jesus says that they will know you are my disciples by how you love one another, right? The, the idea is, is that you have this world that's looking onto the church and they see this radical love and they say, I need that. I want that. That's missing from, from our system. Of belief, so the church is, is is incredibly important. It's also to the church where we're gonna go to comfort and support. But that's a, a whole nother uh, thing. I think I've actually done uh, to the point on the importance of the church. So so kind of uh, let, let, let's put it all into perspective here, um, guys. The, the governments they're gonna rise and fall. Earthly kingdoms they perish. The only kingdom that'll last forever is the kingdom of God. 
And it's, it's there in the kingdom of God that we have to place our ultimate hope and we actually find our peace. And I'm reminded of Paul's words, right? For these are but momentary light afflictions, producing us eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. He goes on to say, while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And when we put on this perspective, a heavenly perspective, a divine uh, eternal perspective, I think withstanding and uh, submitting to the government becomes possible because we're not turning to our own devices. We're turning to the devices that God has given us. And the main one of those is, is love, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him will not perish but inherit eternal life. So God used love, radical love through Jesus, through the giving of his son to subvert the entire world. And I'm just arguing, uh, this is the beginning of an argument that that's what we turn to today when we're faced with incredible challenges coming and not just like what we're seeing on CNN and, and the news, but I, I hear some of our government officials talking and it's, um, it makes me nervous, but I've got Christ. He's my rock. He's my foundation. He's my hope. And, um, and yeah, so with that guys, um, I hope that was helpful. I just want to end here and I'm going to turn to some, uh, some comments. If you guys have any questions, some resources, uh, this one is, uh, fantastic. I'm, I'm almost done with it. I haven't quite finished it, but it's been a really good resource to me. Uh, Joe boot, uh, the ruler of Kings. He's the founder of the Ezra Institute. Um, and he's also a pastor. He's up in Toronto. So he's writing kind of from experience of uh, what's what kind of has transpired there. And the Canadian government, I think, is one step kind of ahead of, ahead of where we're at. Uh, Joe Boot, along the same lines, um, <clears throat> this one is God versus government. And <clears throat> uh, it's Nathan Busnitz and James Coates. And uh, great book. Uh, I like this one because actually my dog ate it, <laughs> but uh, he, she really did. Um, but they alternate the chapters. Um, you know, uh, Buznitz will, will write a chapter and then Coates will write a chapter. So they offer differing opinions. And um, yeah, so so Buznitz is at the Master's Seminary here in Southern California. And Coates is, I believe, is a pastor. Yeah, he's a pastor at Grace Life Church in Edmonton, Canada. And they go back and forth and then they offer some practical examples and tips on how do we uh, stand firm, submit to the government, but also not just go along with the government. You know, how do we um, subvert the government in these ways? Anyways, great book. And if you guys don't have this one yet, this is this is one of the best reads that uh, of the year. And mine is like barely read because I read the, the Kindle version of this one because I take it with me everywhere because it's just so good. Uh, Strange New World by mm -hmm. Carl Truman. Strange New World <clears throat> by Carl Truman. Great book. This is like the, the shortened version of his Rise and Fall, A Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self is his other one that's like probably twice as large. And uh, really both are fantastic. Buy them all. But uh, a lot of the information I shared comes from these three books um, in general. So with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn my attention, my gaze down here to the, my computer screen and see what we got going on. Uh, oh, awesome. Harmony, thanks for placing those resources. Harmony placed these resources uh, right in here for you. So you can just click on the links. Um, let's see here. Natural Guy, it's good to see you again. Well, not see you, but hear from you again. So yay, let's see here. Let's see if there are any, uh, any questions. Lewis, man, my brother, the rulership rests upon our shoulders who are aligned with the spirit of God. God, uh, <clears throat> God uses us, right? Um, God uses us <clears throat> uh, to, to, to rule uh, right here and now, you know, I mean, I think that's, I think you're, I think it's a good comment rests upon our shoulders, but the, but ultimately the government rests upon whose shoulders, right? The governments of the world, they rest upon Jesus' shoulders. That's Isaiah. So, um, yeah, the, the, he, he upholds the governments of the world, which I should include that in, I should have included that. I don't know why I didn't come to my mind. So Lewis, thanks for, uh, for bringing that to my mind though. So, so all of this rests on Jesus's shoulders. Jesus can shoulder this burden. Um, so yeah, let's see here. 
subvert sounds oppositional, forceful, and comprehensive. Between the extremes lies submit to influence. Yeah, but it doesn't start with an S, <laughs> Rick. Um, and it's also, I, I'm, I'm not sure it's uh, to influence. I think influence is too weak of a term. Um, I think, uh, yeah, subvert, it could be. It could be too harsh of a term. Let's try to try to think of another S word because then it, it's a submit to sub, uh, support. We uh, submit to support or we submit to subvert. Um, let me think. Sub, submit to, well, I like subvert because <clears throat> I, I think it fits here. I don't think it has to mean, uh, you know, forceful. Certainly, I think I was really clear actually on that, that, that we never are, are forceful. Uh, in this, we we rely on the things that God has given us, and I don't think that God has given us uh, or permitted us to use force. Those are the things of the world of confusion. So it might sound harsh. Um, I could rethink it. I'm open to that, but uh, it, it works. Let's see here. Natural Gi. I'm so glad that you keep tuning in. Thank you so much uh, for watching uh, every single time. Um, let's see here. The New Reformation Apologetics. Uh, the biggest issue with postmodernism is that the government becomes God. Well, this is this is a really good point. Uh, we ought to resist the veneration of governments, follow what we can do, what we can, but not give up our faith. Yeah, I think that's a really good point here. New Reformation apologetics points this out. You know, um, the the part of the issue with postmodernism is that governments become uh, gods and we all worship at the altar of something, right? We're either going to worship at the altar of, of the true and living God, or we're going to erect idols. And sometimes the idols are fashioned for us, right? I.e. the government. So when we're looking to the government, it, it's actually like a perfect system for, for idolatry, right? Because the government, you become reliant upon, um, uh, reliant upon all of these things you know, the, the way of life, you know, you often, I mean, jobs, I mean, <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, the biggest, excuse me, the biggest employer of people in this country is the government, um, which is concerning, you know, uh, when we were, when so many people rely on the government or certainly, um, I mean, during COVID we saw this, I mean, the government was, was kind of, we're, we're looking to the government for, for our vaccines. We're looking to the government for, for financial support. We're looking, and I'm not saying all these things are bad in and of themselves, right? I mean, I think one of the roles that the government should be about is taking care of the least of these, right? That's part of uh, the prescription of God, right? To do justice, right? If they're going to seek righteousness, the government, um, if they're going to reward good and punish evil, part of that is, is the pursuit of the least of these and caring for them. Um, but when we become dependent on these things, they can become idols really, really quickly. And we see this oftentimes. That's kind of like why I mentioned the conflation between evangelicalism and, and political conservatism, conservatism. Um, because I'm not saying this is everywhere. I mean, it's not everybody, but it does. It seems like there's been a, even for people who generally share my world, you have become maybe, a, a, a they've, it's just, it's just walking a fine line where it becomes, where's your allegiance, um, because sometimes our allegiance to Christ is going to not only warrant, but require our uh, separation from even comfortable groups and political parties and whatnot that we would traditionally uh, fall in line with. So um, awesome. Let's see here. Oh, Natural Gee, thank you so much. Uh, th this is like, this has been something that's been on my mind for a while now, and I'm trying to work it out. I'd like to maybe make it into a formal talk and, and be able to present it at, at uh, conferences and churches or whatnot. Um, because I think I think that there's important things that we need to understand about the, the role of the government and then our role underneath a government that, that doesn't share or align with our worldview. Because I see this coming. Like, it, it, it's everywhere. Um, and it's not just... Uh, it, it, who who what what political party holds office in the White House? You know, um, it, it can uh, it, everything's kind of a little bit concerning. So, so while this issue, I said it, I think at the front forefront of the, our time together, while this issue doesn't directly relate to a specific current event, I think it relates to a lot of stuff. Certainly, looking into the future, I think it relates to some some things that happened. So, I'm glad that you found some benefit in it. Um, let's see here. Um, John, do you think the founding fathers of America had ample justification for going to war with the British keeping in mind? Uh, God bless you, brother. Yeah, this is like, you know, I'm still kind of wrestling through this 
So MacArthur, so John MacArthur would say no, <laughs> that it was, an, that it was ultimately sinful. Um, it's a, this is a hard one for me. Um, I could see an instance, I could see where the, the American revolution is, um, what was justified from a biblical worldview. Um, if the, 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 the resistance was like the war was brought to them. Um, I don't know. I, I honestly, I got to say, I don't know this one. Um, it's also comes to my mind, like how many, how many of the, these, these, these men were, you know, uh, were Christian, right? I mean, certainly some of them, but fewer than we were, than I was taught at least in, you know, in school growing up, you know, I was, I was taught in school. I went to a public school. Uh, now they're probably, be, it's probably taught the complete opposite way, right? None of them were Christians. Well, some of them were, but not all of them. So it's a different, <coughs> excuse me. It's a different, I think a, 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 it's a different set of rules, you know? Um, but I don't know. I, I, that, uh, that's, that's the question that I've been, maybe I'll do a, a to the point, or maybe I'll do a, a blog. That'd be a good form for that. Actually. Maybe I'll do a blog entry on that. Um, I'm going to write a note, uh, because I, th I think that that's, that's a really good question. Um, American revolution. Awesome. Um, I, last, last year I did, uh, a year and a half ago, two years, I did a lot of reading on, I did biographies it was kind of my, my fun reading. So I read a couple on Abraham Lincoln, uh, two on George Washington. I read, uh, one on Adams and Hamilton and uh, then I read uh, McCullough's 1776, and all of them were, were really great. I wish I read just the 1776, not the one on Washington, because it was like the same exact thing. But um, yeah, anyways, I'm wrestling with that. That's a really good question, man. Uh, Matt, thank you uh, for asking it, uh, but I don't have a, a clear answer for you. I've, I've read and seen people I respect land uh, on different places. So good question. I don't have a clear cut answer yet. Yeah. Right when I'm about to say an answer, I'm like, no, that's wrong. So I need to look into it more. Let's see here. In your opinion, do we need more polemics in public, in public places? Personally, I don't think many people are never really challenged with anything but straw man's which, uh, with online echo chair, <laughs> excuse me. Um, I agree. The second part is, is absolutely true. Uh, as far as echo chambers, um, I think we, I think it's human nature. Um, I think it's human nature to gravitate towards people that we agree with. Uh, I think I'm probably in the, I, I like conflict. I like running towards the kind of the argument in the, in a argument in the good sense of the word. Um, but I think that's rare. Um, but as far as like polemics go, um, it depends what you mean by polemic, right? If, if you're talking about, uh, a, 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 like a, just a, a strongly worded argument or, um, arguments in general debates. Yeah. You know, uh, but if, if we're, uh, if it's an, uh, if it's an attack, cause I've heard polemic used both ways. Right. But I mean, traditionally I, I I've understood it as being a, a formal refutation or addressing of somebody's ideas. And I think that these, I, I, I think public pu having these things in public is a good thing. Um, if you, if you can do it appropriately, you know, if it results in, uh, you, making Jesus look foolish or harsh or something. We certainly don't want to do that because we're ambassadors um, of Christ. But when we look at also, when we look at the, you know, the biblical model here, I mean, Paul and, and the, all the apostles, I mean, <laughs> um, I mean, all through acts, right. A lot of these things that were happening in public places, uh, you know, J John was, was out in public, you know, um, you know, Paul and Silas, the reason why they were got to into jail is because they were in public paul in front of the areopagus right that's a that's a public forum um to a certain extent you know people can come watch the discussions and there's something to be said about that uh, if if it's done in a way that uh, that brings that brings a lot of light instead of heat to the argument right we want to be furthering uh, the cause of christ not hindering from it 
So, um, and always avoiding straw men or any, any really uh, fallacious type of argument. Um, that's why I like tactics so much, to be honest with you. The book Tactics, uh, Greg's book, I'm sure most of you guys here have read it. You know, I like it so much because it, it offers a way to, to engage in, in conversation, even public polemics, like what you're saying, dialogue, in a way that's completely non-aggressive. You know, it's just asking questions. And the part I really like about asking questions, um, especially Columbo, is you take the time to actually understand what the other person is saying before you offer any type of response. Because like, it's just true of me, if I'm being honest, you know, oftentimes I run into arguments because I like the argument, I like it. So I run into it. And, uh, and then all of a sudden I spend five minutes refuting something that they don't even, they're not even the person I'm talking to doesn't even believe, you know? Uh, so it's better to ask some questions, get clarifying uh, statements from them, learn what the other person believes, and then you can offer a critique. Um, here, let's, uh, you, you added this comment here just now, new reformation apologetics. Yeah. I also lean towards making the case and having a debate. Yeah. It's meant to stir up thought rather than beat people. Yes. The right there is like stirring up. This is like, this is, this is a major component in, in our culture that I feel like is going by the wayside. And honestly, guys, this is why I don't interact online very much. I, I just don't, even when I add a comment, it, it seems to me recently in the last couple of years, like even when I add just a comment at anything, it could be, yeah, you know what? I think the sky is, is actually like a turquoise blue today. It's really pretty. No, that's not turquoise blue. It can't possibly. And it's just like, that's what you're met with. Like an argument, like argumentative arguments, as opposed to like, just, whoa, I'm just trying to make a comment on something I'm observing and enjoy, you know, or if I have questions, oftentimes I'll, I'll, I, I commented on one, one, one person's thread recently. They, they listed a bunch of people who are great academics, uh, Christian academics. And one of the guys on the list, I didn't, I, I recognized the name, but I didn't know where, I recognized it from, and I asked the question and I had like people kind of jump down my throat. Like, what are you saying? He can't be a Christian. I'm like, no, I'm just wondering, is this who you mean? Is this who you're talking about? So anyway, so we're argumentative, but if, if, if we're leaning towards making a case and having a, a, a like a formal or informal debate, like this is, this is where I, the, I, the exchange of ideas is a good thing. That's, that's what, that's what we need to be getting back to. You know, we should, we should be slow to be offended you know, we, we the, the Christians should be the least offendable people on the planet. So, so when somebody says something, one, I always try to give people the benefit of the doubt, even if they're, they're really being harsh. I'm going to try to give somebody the benefit of the doubt and just ask clarifying questions. Hey, this is is this what you meant? Because this is kind of like what I gathered, or this is kind of like what it sounded like, and offer them an opportunity to, to correct it. Um, but yeah, conversations and also having dialogues back and forth. You don't have to have a winner. Like <clears throat> I can have a perfectly wonderful conversation with somebody I disagree with. Uh, like, I mean, disagree with vehemently across an, any number of things. I can still have a good conversation and it can end without, you know, ground given or without, you know, uh, agreeing or anything like that. And, and, you know, it can end, it can run a natural course. Be like, oh, okay, well, I hope I've given you something to think about and you've given me something to think about. Thanks for the talk. Um, but yeah. I think it's important, you know, um, it's, it's meant to stir up thought rather than beat people into submission. We don't want to ever be beating people in submission. That's not what that's, that's, I mean, that's not what God does. I mean, God doesn't do that in the, in the salvation of his, of his, of, of mankind, right? He, of the people like of us, of Christians, he doesn't beat us into submission, you know? <laughs> so yeah, anyways, good, uh, good comment in reformation. Thanks for watching, man. Really appreciate it. All right. Let's see here. When do you think it uh, justify to refuse to follow the government's rules? For example, do you think we should close churches again? In, yeah, uh, from Canada. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, is it Kenna? This is this is a this is a fantastic point. I think uh, that when g the government's rules, when the government's rules directly violate God's principles and rules, is when we. Uh, disobey. That doesn't mean we don't submit. And I think the pastor in Canada, I forget his name off the top of my mind. Uh, he made the news nationally, internationally. Um, I think he served a really good example of this. I think he said, I'm not closing my church 
for X, Y, or Z, ultimately on God's authority. And then the police came to his door and they arrested him and he spent time in jail and faced fines and, um, and whatnot. So I think when, when the two, see, the boot, um, Joe boots book is really great on this kind of stuff because he does a good job of, of drawing the distinction between the government and the church. They are not the same thing. They're separate entities, right? They're both things that God's given to us, uh, for the building of society, right? The, that combined with the family. So these three spheres are what God's given us, uh, for differing, but overlapping principles. And <clears throat> ultimately the, the church I think is incredibly, incredibly important. And we have kind of drifted from that importance recently. Uh, what happens on Sunday mornings, it's, it isn't just a time to gather and sing a bunch of songs to make us feel good, or I'm not saying that pejoratively or to make fun of anybody, but something actually happens. Like, right. There's something special about Sunday mornings as the church Catholic. And I don't mean Roman Catholic, the church universal. We Christians, we gather all on the same day to do a multiple of things, including, um, you know, we, 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 uh, we come together. Yes. To support one another. We, we praise God. We celebrate who God is, but we also do battle with Satan. We, we also pray uh, corporately for our leaders and, and the people in, that are ruling us and ruling the nations and, and stuff like that. And, and th these things are important. Like church life is important. Um, so yeah, when it comes to, for me, at least I know for my church where I pastor, I pastor a small little church, um, a lay pastor, uh, it would take a lot for, for me to close my doors again, um, at the church. But, but then again, you do it, you, 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 you assess the situation. You have your, the, the, the well being and the best for your people in mind. And then you do according, and this is a principle that Paul lays out in Romans 13, right? We all, we do it all in conscience sake. So our conscience is a powerful thing. And, uh, it, we gotta be in tune with our conscience because our conscience is what? It's the pinging of the Holy Spirit, you know, and it's the way that it's one of the ways that God gets our attention. It's one of the way God helps us learn. So we got to follow our conscience there. So I, while I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't condemn uh, a pastor or a church that closes their doors in the midst of a, a pandemic or whatnot, it would, it, depending on the situation, it would, it would take a lot for me to do it. And then this is a, if you guys want to read more, this is another one, uh, God versus government, um, where, uh, Boosnitz and, and Coates, they, they do a good job of exploring and asking and answering these types of questions. And that's pretty much where, that's at least where I took it, that they landed, you know, the, the, the amazing things happen during church. Uh, and it's important. Church is important to keep open. Um, so yeah, good question. All right, let's see. New Reformation apologetics. I think it may, may be a symptom of online uh, discourse yeah depersoning others well online there you're not talking with a person you're just talking with this thing like a computer it feels like right um plus you never know if it's just a a bot nowadays <laughs> yeah I, I i'm fairly certain most people most of the things or people that i'm interacting with on online aren't bots but um but yeah it's i the, the online discourse is hard i don't see I think it's, I think I'm learning, what I'm learning is that the, the benefits are outweighed by the, um, costs for this stuff. Um, let's see here, Matt, uh, another issue with governments is our factions or political parties. <laughs> yeah, they can be right. So they don't have to be, you know, they don't have to be idols. Political parties don't have to be idols. Remember, an idol is something that that replaces God in your life. It's the thing that you turn to for comfort, hope, satisfaction, and ultimately salvation. So uh, if you're looking for the solutions of the world to come through political parties and not God or before God, there's probably an issue going. I mean, there's an issue going on. And you should really rethink your position on uh, politics and political parties in general. But that's a good comment. Um Rick here under atheism, the ultimate authority is the government of the collective under Americanism. It's God through the people and the people have authority to choose their government. Uh, WRT 1776. Um, 
Yeah, ultimately, under atheism, total authority is with. I, I mean, you can you can assign it to the collective or the government, but it, I, I would say it's ultimately in, it's completely subjective. All you with on atheism, you're left with uh, relativism, and relativism places the authority with the individual. I mean, you can uh, I guess lend that to the collective and social contract theory or whatnot. Um, but either way, I think you kind of get um, you get into the same mess. It's all just a uh, you know, moral relativism, you, uh, political relativism, there isn't really a right and a wrong. Um, under Americanism, it's God through the people, and the people have the authority to choose their government. Yeah, I don't really know what Americanism is. I've just never heard that. I mean, I think I've heard that term, but I don't really know what you mean by that. So um, most of the people, I don't hear people talk about their political beliefs this way, that God's working through the people. I think I, that's an interesting statement. I, I mean, it's it's totally true, but I feel like most people lean into their free will, and that's where some issues can happen. But anyways, that's like that's an interesting comment, Rick. Thank you for that. I got to think about it. Um, let's see here. What else do we got? I think we shouldn't blindly follow a party, but it does doesn't make the ideas of parties inherently evil. Yeah. I, I agree. I mean, I think that there's like there their labels and distinctions between groups are sometimes helpful, like Christian and non-Christian, <laughs> right? And and of course you're gonna you're gonna label we're gonna label ourselves according to our ideological positions on certain things, and that's totally fine. Uh, pro-life, pro-choice. I mean, I think those labels in particular get kind of muddy, um, especially yeah they can get kind of money. But, but when I say that, I know, we know what we're talking about almost right away, right? We're talking about abortion. And if you tell me you're pro-life, I almost right away know that, okay, well then you and I probably agree on the majority of the issues having to do with this, right? If you say you're pro-choice, I know that you're most, most, uh, most commonly when somebody says they're pro-choice, it means that they're pro-choice having to do with abortion, right? Um, just like when, like, I'm, I don't think the person that's pro-choice is anti-life, and I don't think the pro-choice person thinks that I'm anti-choice. I'm choice. Uh, I'm pro-choice in, in almost everything, except, well, specifically not when it comes to uh, elective abortions. Um, anyways, the vice versa. You get my point. So yeah, labels can, labels can be healthy, uh, healthy, um, and and it's just it, I think it's a it's an okay system, right? To, you you fall into a group, and those groups help delineate um, where people are at. Commonly, I think within the political spectrum, I don't I I, I think the, the the party labels are getting less and less helpful. Personally, um, uh, less and less helpful because. Uh, I don't like what was <laughs> what 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 categorized as a uh, average run of the mill Republican 25 years ago is not my perception of what a Republican is now. The, the, certainly, that's true with with the Democrat too, right? The parties keep going growing apart. Um, so, yeah, um, but good 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 comment, uh, New Reformation man. Thank you so much for the interaction uh, this whole time. Let's see here. Kina, like a bee, B key, Kina. I love it. I like names that I've never really heard before. But well, you've been on here before, though. I recognize this name. Um, the pastor is Arthur Pulowski, or maybe Tobias Tissot, or James Coates. Or <laughs> yeah, it could have been. It might have been Coates, but well, no, because Coates. I don't think it was Coates. I mean, he wrote that book. Oh man. Yeah, it was one of. It, I, it might have been uh, Palowski right there, the the Arthur Palowski. I don't remember off the top of my mind, but there there are many. You're right. Uh, these these are just if you tuned in, if you're just tuning in now, these are the pastors who kind of disobeyed the Can Canadian, not kind of, they disobeyed the Canadian government in, in a relation to whether or not they're going to open their churches or have their churches open during COVID, and then they suffered the consequences. They're they're decent examples of exactly what I'm saying that we submit to subvert. Um, we we submit. Um, but doesn't necessarily mean we obey always question. Let's see here. Okay. Question is the government, we get uh, a judgment from God. Well, that's a H H W D 71. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think it's clear through scripture that that is often the case. Uh, that is often the case. Daniel nine, 
<laughs> Daniel 9. Uh, if we had the time, we don't. I would read that whole chapter. You, you should go read that chapter. I think it's Daniel 9. Now I have to look. Um, but uh, the, absolutely, God, God uses uh, the government. Uh, and one of the ways that he uses a government is for him to uh, j- j- judge a nation. We see that throughout uh, the Old Testament. We see that in the New Testament. Um, so yeah, no, what I'm going to, I'm not going to flip to it right now because it's going to take too much time. Daniel nine. I mean, we see it everywhere, uh, that, that God uses the government to judge people, including his people, including us. So, uh, we could be in a time of judgment. That's the way I feel like right now. That's why I said in the, in before, uh, like if you rewind the, the video, I said that we're in a, we're in the desert. We're kind of wandering right now, guys. Um, and I understand that at least that's the way I feel. I feel like I'm wandering. I feel like I don't have a place to call home. I feel like, uh, God, you know, I know that the kingdom of God is, is, is here, but not yet. I know the full, uh, consummation of it is coming. And I think, uh, yeah, but, um, but I think God uses govern the governments of men to judge people and, uh, we could be in a, in a time of judgment right now. So that's a good question. Um, good, good, good. <laughs> um, Let's see here. Are there any questions? What, Rick, what are you saying here? Uh, pro-choice is a euphemism because what's advocated is an option, not a choice. Doesn't that make it equivocation um, and therefore dishonest? Um, well, this is this is why I kind of said like the, even these choices are a little bit unhealthy. They're getting a little bit more muddied. Uh, these these labels rather are a little bit more muddied. Um, I, so here's where it comes to like when I'm Rick, when I'm having a conversation with somebody, I'm, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. Do I think a person when they label themselves pro-choice are, are, uh, intentionally equivocating, like making equivocation? I don't know. Um, is it maybe I understand your point. Um, but I, I give them the benefit of the doubt. I think that these are labels that have been assigned to the movement. Now, I think the labels in general, like at the very beginning might be, I, I think we're problematic, right? You, the, the, there's very, these things are intentional. These things didn't get labeled pro-choice, pro-life. They didn't get labeled by accident. I mean, people actually thought about what they were doing. This is at least in my experience, this seems to be, or from my point of view, this seems to be the way the world works, right? These things that that are larger labels for things, they have a, an ideology, a, a thought process behind them. They have a worldview behind them. And it gets thrown out there and it might look like, like uh, with the Black Lives Matter stuff, right? It got thrown out there and it might look kind of at the front like, yeah, oh, Black Lives Matter. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But but behind the whole thing is 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 something more, right? So so you're when the when the term is thrown out the out into the you know the the court of public opinion or whatever, the in, in onto the table of of ideas, it, you see the tip of the iceberg. You don't see the iceberg. <laughs> below it and it's, it's probably true for for pro-choice um and and pro pro-life in, in general right and pro-life is a great term too but when we talk about it we're not i mean anyways yeah mm-hmm. i think I, th- I think you bring up a good point but i generally give people the benefit of the doubt when it's like that when when these things come up um you know one of them just te- checking my text real quick to make sure that i'm not missing anything because harmony is our social media coordinator and she's rad and she texts me sometimes when i miss stuff um, but it's not that case right now. Um, yeah, one of the, one of the ways I think there's, there's two or three principles when you're talking to somebody, if you want to have a su- successful conversation with somebody, uh, the first is that, that I think you should be genuinely interested in the person. Like if you're going to talk to somebody, at least give them, give them that, like be genuinely interested in what they're saying. And you'd be amazed if you actually can like, put it on your mind that I'm going to listen to this person because I'm actually interested in what they have to say. Even if I disagree with them, I'm interested instead of like, oftentimes I feel like it leads to, this leads to some of the comments that have been made before, as far as especially online comments and discussions and the inability or the unwillingness of people to actually have an honest dialogue. Uh, it, you, even if you disagree with somebody, we should be interested in what they say because people are interesting. I, I mean, people are really interesting to me. I love talking to people, people I agree with, people I disagree with, people who don't know what they think, people who think things about stuff I don't know what I think about, you know, because it, 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 I just think that, well, people are amazing. <laughs> you know, people are made in the image of God. They're, they're God's handiwork. 
you know, they're, they're the pinnacle of creation and, you know, we'll spend oftentimes all this time going out and I do going out hiking and enjoying nature and God's creation that way. And I try to put this on my mind that, that when I talk to somebody, it's, it's, it's exploring, uh, the pinnacle of God's creation. It's exploring, uh, the, the human mind and, and humanity in general and being able to talk to these people. And even when I disagree, so I, I generally like, I, I try to be genuinely interested in what the person is saying to me even if it's a mundane subject how you make nails or i don't know um what water tastes like or something like this that, that have no eternal significance really but i just like to know what people think um the next thing is the, the next principle that i have if you want to have good dialogue with people is, is uh, give them the benefit of the doubt um i'm a thick-skinned guy you know we should all be thick-skinned as christians and i'd give people the benefit of the doubt I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to believe that the person has no ul ulterior motives when, when we're talking and if they prove otherwise, then that's fine. Like I'm not naive. I'm not gullible. I go into it with my eyes wide open, but I tend to be genuinely interested in the person, give them my full undivided attention, and then also give them the benefit of the doubt. So if they trip up, uh, I do it with the understanding that I know that I'm going to trip up because man, I am abrasive sometimes. I know that but I'm never meaning to be. I just get really excited and I just really want to get my ideas out there. I really want to have this conversation and, and talk because because sometimes it's exciting and, and I lean into that too much sometimes. So I want them to give me the benefit of the doubt. So I give them the benefit of the doubt um, regardless. So anyways, those are two things. I have a couple. I can do like one more. Oh, here's a question. Um, let's see here. Um, question, how, how do you think, uh, sphere sovereignty plays or plays a role here? The authority that God has given the family, the church and the state. Yeah, oh, man, yeah, I will, I, I, I think it plays, I, I think, I think, uh, it plays a huge role. Um, so by sphere sovereignty, what what I th correct me if I'm wrong, Travis, but what you mean is each one of these spheres is operating independent of e of each other. You know, so so you have three spheres. I first learned this um, actually um, from oh man, I want to say Del Tackett. Do you guys remember the Truth Project? That was like one of my first introductions to Christian apologetics, and. Um, yeah. And so he taught on the, the different spheres. Um, so, so you have the government, um, you have the church and, uh, and then you have the family. And I guess like how, how sphere sorry, plays a role. If you have time, Travis, just add a clarifying statement to that. Um, how do you think sphere sovereignty plays a role here? I think, I mean, authority that God has given the family church. God has given them each authority. The authority is independent of the other, um, but they overlap, right? The functions overlap with, with one another is kind of what I would say, but I just don't know if I'm answering your question here. Um, yeah, like they have, they have differing responsibilities, um, each sphere, you know, and the distinct responsibilities are distinct according to each sphere, but there's going to be, there is going to be some, some overlap, uh, for example, how we, how we treat the family. We, we see this in modern day examples, right? How we, the, 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 the rules, the, the laws that we make, uh, from the government, um, the laws that we make from the government are going to affect our families and vice versa, how we look at the family is going to affect the things that we enact in the government. And certainly the, the, the same is true. You could same is true for the government and the church and everything like that. Um, so if that's what you mean, I mean, I think that the, uh, the, I mean, it's a good way to think about it. I think there's a decent, decent way to categorize it. The issue with the sphere sovereignty that I'm running into right now, isn't so much to do with what it actually teaches or the understanding of it is it's related to like the neo Calvinist stuff. And regardless of where you are on Calvinism or, or um, Reformed theology or whatever, uh, it just has a bad name. And so there's connotations. So when you start using the word, the term sphere sovereignty, I feel like people jump out of the conversation right away. Um, but I, that nevertheless, I think that God has given these three institutions to the culture 
And I think it's important to um, understand what each one is. And that's something that in, in Ruler of Kings Boot does a really great job, especially in the distinction between the government and the church. And I think especially it's especially relevant today as there seems to be this gravitation of the two, the government and the church kind of coming together a little bit. Um, so, uh, yeah, okay, Travis, thanks for adding this comment. Spheres can overlap a bit, but yes, yes, one overreaches, that's when there becomes a huge problem. And I mean, a problem, but and the problem is big. And we're seeing that with the, with the government and the church, I think, today. Um, it's important to understand the, 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 the spheres and that they're, they're, they're independent. Um, there will be overlap because they affect one another, but they are independent. So that's a good question. Um, <laughs> Donovan. Yeah. I mean, God uses the government to judge the nation. You really want to go there. I'm like, I'm just, I mean, I'm not really wanting to go anywhere. I'm answering a question. And it seems to me like the biblical case, is clear. I mean, it seems to me like God uses the government to judge. It seems like he certainly did uh, in the time of Daniel. Um, he certainly did in the time of Moses. Um, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't have a problem with it. Um, oh, you're so nice. <laughs> so far, questions have been answered. You added that, and then you say, most important for me are the list of books and articles to read. Thank you for taking the time to share with us. It, this is like what I love to do, guys. Um, I really enjoy sp even this fake time with you. <laughs> like, I'm just not, any, I'd much rather be face to face with you. Um, but this is really what I like to do is just uh, kind of spend my time chit chatting and, and talking and even disagreeing. Um, so anyways, uh, with that, let me see if there's, um, I, I can do maybe do one more. No, that's out of each other. All right, guys. So what, um, before we, before we kind of wrap up here, uh, thank you one, uh, first and foremost, thank you for your attention, uh, during this stuff. Um, but also, uh, let me think. What do we have? Oh, guys, I can't even believe I'm not announcing this already, but it's July. That means if you're in Southern California, we have the Reality Student Apologetics coming up, conference coming up. Registration is already active. I think Early Bird is going to end fairly soon. So go to realityapologetics.com. And I'm not just pumping this because I'm part of the team. I'm at STR. But like before I was a speaker at STR, I would go to these conferences whenever I could um, because they're really, really good. And this year, the whole focus is on the deconversion stuff or um, deconstruction, the Christian deconstruction stuff that we're seeing kind of all over the place now. It's getting even more popular, I, which is which is amazing. I mean, so we're going to be hitting up really hard issues. I'm going to be carrying my suicide talk through, uh, through the session again. But uh, most of the other talks are going to be having to do with the deconversion phenomenon, de uh, deconstruction phenomenon that we're seeing within the, the body of Christ, where people are are reporting that they're Christian and then they're leaving Christianity. And, and why is that? We're going to wrestle with these. So realityapologetics.com, make sure you go there. Also, you want to keep your, your eyes open to uh, STRU, STR University. Um, it's going to be str.org backslash training. And at STRU, we're going to be launching... I think two new courses in the next week or so. I, I believe I, that's what I saw in my email. So the, mine on, on biblical justice is going to be coming out. And then uh, there's one other, I forget. Oh man, I should know that. I'm a team player, right? But uh, there's two new courses coming out. Um, and you want to make sure that you are pursuing justice. And there's another one, I thought. Maybe not. But uh, but you don't want to, if you haven't gone to STRU and you haven't signed up, you need to. It's really, really great. I actually go through them with my kids. It's a lot of fun. They're free. I uh, really high quality, high production videos where we are uh, we're just trying to offer free training to you guys how to process and think through some of the more difficult issues in, out in the culture today. Um, so you'll find stuff on abortion, homosexuality, tactics, justice, evil, all that stuff. Um, and, uh, and we're having a good time producing them. So, and then all, of course, guys right now, like, this is crazy. I've been on the road maybe for the better part of two weeks. Uh, for one of those weeks, I was able to take my family um, with me, which was amazing. One of the weeks I didn't, uh, but we're so busy, but we would love <clears throat> to, to continue on the road and, and come out to your churches or any events that you have. The, the speakers at STR were available. 
uh, we would love to to come with you and, and share with with you whatever we have that that you might be interested in. So, if you'd like to maybe possibly book a, a speaker from STR to come to one of your events, you can go to the STR webpage. You click on training, and you'll see the speaker pages right there. You can read about each of us as five speakers now. There's, of course, Greg, who, uh, who's incredible. They're all incredible. Uh, Alan, uh, who's traveling right now too. He's in Beirut, which is like unbelievable. Uh, Tim Barnett, you guys know him as Red Pen Logic. If you haven't checked Red Pen out, you should. Robbie Lashua, he's our newest. He came on in the new year and myself. Um, and we would love to, one of us, all of us, some of us would love to come out and, and share some personal time with you, not just through a camera, but actually uh, in the flesh, incarnate. <laughs> so anyways, with that, guys, I really appreciate um, all the comments. I appreciate you guys lasting in here with me for an hour. And uh, I'm John Noyes. This was To The Point for Stand The Reason. I will see you, I think, in two weeks, uh, every other Wednesday. So I'll talk to you then, guys. God bless you guys.